I want to start us. I'd like to start us off with some prayer. Um, Carol Rose isn't here yet. I think she's on her way, but Carol has been walking and partnering um, through our coalition with the uh, um, Western Apache people with Apache Stronghold, who are protecting a sacred site known as Oak Flat. Some of you may have heard of Oak Flat, maybe even visited Oak Flat um, near Tucson, Arizona. And they are um, protecting this site at risk of um, a land transfer from the National Forest Service to a copper mining company, Resolution Copper, with a who has proposed to um, create a mile wide crater in the midst of that sacred site to mine for copper in a very extractive way of mining. So the San Carlos Apache and other Western Apache peoples and their allies have been resisting um, through prayer and ceremony and through advocacy. Um, they've been appealing up the courts and plan now to go to the Supreme Court with their case if it's heard. And so one of their main calls to us as a coalition partnering with them is to pray, is to, is to call on the spirit of life, to call on creator, um, to respond, to see, to um, stop this land transfer. So I invite you wherever you are, if you're sitting or standing, to just sense the earth beneath you, to breathe deeply, to settle in if you need to. And let's just take a few breaths together. And you can pray in whatever way you like silently with me. The Apache Stronghold and some of their allies are going on a run, an annual run this weekend starting today. They might well be on their way right now as we speak, going through the hot desert sun up a sacred mountain um, as a form of prayer. And so sense into your feet if you can. Sense into your limbs, your muscles. Imagining right now, imagining these runners out in the desert, their feet pounding on the road, their breath taking deep breaths of the warm air, pumping through their veins, blood flowing, Everything flowing with a desire for restoration of these beautiful lands, for continuance and survival of their peoples and language and ceremony. Creator, we join our prayers and breath. We join our longing for shalom. We pray in the power in name of Jesus, that this transfer will be stopped. We pray that peace will dwell again in that land. God, I pray for a spirit of repentance and transformation over our peoples and the Mennonite church and beyond, that we would also follow the way that leads to life. Be willing to stand in the way of violence. Let's take another deep breath together, breathing in the spirit of life, breathing out our longings and prayers for justice with the Apache stronghold. May it be so, amen. Please continue to pray in whatever way you can or, and um, bringing this to your congregations and communities. Um, we'll be sharing opportunities for other forms of advocacy as well. We had a training in May about calling on our congressional representatives and, um, and did that on that repair network call and on that prayer and action call. And this coming Friday next week, we'll be hosting another prayer and action call. Um, and I and several people in this room and others will be going camping at Oak Flat and hopefully meeting with some of the leaders, Wensler Nosey and others. And we'll bring back um, their requests um, to this group and to the prayer and action call of how we're next called to pray together and to act together. 
and maybe we'll make some phone calls together on that call as well. Um, well, I want to, after we, we like to start and ground with prayer, but for those who are new, I want to introduce the Repair Network. We are a network of um, Mennonite congregations and communities who have joined the Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition that we're part of. And we commit to journey together toward deeper solidarity with Indigenous peoples. We have a framework of seven steps of commitment on our website. Um, and we encourage each other in those steps that move from education and lament to land acknowledgement to putting restitution in the budget to seeking reparations to joining um, actions of solidarity with indigenous peoples and responding to campaigns both locally and internationally that our coalition is a part of. Um, and some of, that, some of that journey is spreading the word and being contagious. Some of that journey is prayer, sharing stories and mistakes with each other, learning together um, to move beyond those mistakes and, um, and sharing resources together. Um, so today I've invited in that spirit two Repair Network community representatives, um, Lou Gasho and John Stays and Do Hoyer, um, who may be with us as well uh, from the Twin Cities Repair Network to share about how they're partnering with indigenous communities in their areas and doing creative actions to remember indigenous presence on the land and also to support indigenous led um, justice initiatives. So I'm going to share my screen and I'd love to share an update with you all of who's in the network now. This is the doctrine of dis dismantling the doctrine of discovery coalitions. Um, mission here is to call on the church to address the extinction, extraction, and enslavement done in the name of Christ on indigenous lands. And you all, this is the first year of the repair network. We're joining the coalition to move beyond um, committees and volunteer work to engage as entire um, communities like Camp Friedenswald, which is a Mennonite camp, or as congregations, um, which many of you are a part of. Um, I'll just skip through our structure here to show you our updated list. And I wanna say welcome to Hyde Park Mennonite Church in Idaho, which is our newest Repair Network congregation and just joined this week. I think Roger Piper Ruth is on the call. Welcome to you all and so glad that you've joined. Um, we are now at 16, I believe, official Repair Network members with another about 10 who are in process of joining and making that community decision together. So woohoo! <laughs> going from, what was it, maybe five or six uh, May last year um, to 16 now and 10 in the wings, um, waiting to hear back on their final decision as a congregation or community. I would love to invite um, Hallie up now, who has been working on a mapping project of uh, the Repair Network. And we're gonna share that with you. And Hallie Liu is someone who came to us um, from the Portland area, who brings expertise in GIS mapping for the city of Portland. I don't know if you wanna share an introduction, Hallie, to yourself and just this idea for a Repair Network map that came up. Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Hallie. Nice to see you people in person and on the screen. Uh, wait, what am I sharing? This is a map. I make maps. Um, so this map is showing the communities that are in the repair network currently. And what the... Yeah, so Hallie has been working with us over the past year to imagine what would, a what would we want a map to look like on our website to represent the repair network as congregations join that could be updated automatically through, I don't know what kind of magic, but like through a spreadsheet that somehow links yes. <laughs> whenever a new network or a new congregation joins, it would automatically populate on a map that Hallie has put together that's open source. Yes. So do you want to give an example? Uh, uh, sure. 
um, hello, Hyde Park Mennonite Fellowship. Happy to have you. You're on the map. Um, <laughs> I think that, you know, we tend to think of maps as being authoritative, but they're really tools to examine a relationship in a new and different way. Um, and so, uh, you know, you have committed to being in our network, but uh, it's not an authoritative, uh, it's just a representation. So it's just, this is just a tool to help us think about it. Um, and so the idea here is that, you know, we can get to your website. If your community has a website, uh, we can find out whose lands um, you share. Uh, eventually we would like to add the, if you've been to the native land map, which is at uh, native-land.ca. Um, they have a API that will allow us to also borrow their data um, that they are getting directly from different indigenous communities who wish to be represented. Uh, and that's, you know, also not authoritative. It's just a general idea. So eventually we would like to add those, um, add those communities so that we can explore, you know, the, who are the neighbors of other communities in the network. Um, can we ask a question? Yes. In the room? So for those of you who are gathered here in this room in Albuquerque at the, at the church here, what do you notice about this map? What's not on this map that jumps out to you? Todd? Borders, yeah. So we're not seeing borders like state or country borders. Anything else that jumps out? About maybe what is on the map? We do see rivers, yes. And that was intentional in Hallie's part to try to show more of the water systems um, that define geography and watersheds versus the, the um, state and often arbitrary dividing lines um, that, yes. that you know, so atlas is used. Yeah. Imposed boundaries <laughs> that are artificial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are mm -hmm. more of the things, you know, that were created uh, and kind of result in other types of boundaries. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Hallie? And I guess one question I would have Hallie is what's the next stage of the map for us? Uh, well, we would also like to add the watersheds in addition to the indigenous lands information. Um, so indigenous territories and languages. Um, and, uh, and the watersheds as well. And if I, you know, this is also a tool for all of us. So if you have feedback, we would love uh, your feedback in on any thoughts that you have about it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> and we'll put the link in the chat for you to explore it and make sure that the information that we drew from the spreadsheet you contributed to is correct. Yes, yeah. definitely. If you see like wrong information, please, please let us know. <laughs> And we'll email that out. Any questions right now for Hallie while she's here or about the MAP project? Any thoughts, questions? Pretty straightforward. I'm looking at the chat here. Let's see if anything comes up. I'm not seeing Hallie on the screen participant list. Can we be in touch? Yes, I'll share um, my information. And if Hallie gives permission, Hallie's information through email follow-up, Sylvie, Sylvia, with everybody. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, everyone. So you can kind of see. Let's give Holly a hand. <laughs> we wanted to like, at one point, we were going to flip the map like upside down and some, some different like decolonial maps just orient us in different ways. We wanted to have enough of an orientation that we can navigate the map as folks used to maps looking this way with our version southeast west um, I want to um, take a moment and invite you all to consider um, do you know of any other communities who you're connected with who weren't on the map <laughs> any other communities who weren't on our list um, who you could invite to join the repair network feel free to share them in the chat Maybe people, the only prerequisite to joining is that you've done some kind of 101 level intro um, to the doctrine of discovery, to the impacts of settler colonization. Um, who is somebody that you could reach out to by, you know, Zoom or email, phone call, 
And then if you haven't joined yet as a congregation or community, what's your next step towards joining our network? Because we want to be a network of support. We want to be a network of um, that, that grows exponentially. And I'm just one part-time organizer, and I would love to empower everybody else here to be an ambassador for the Repair Network and to go out and share with others. I see a question from Jonathan, yeah. Oh, is it not sharing on the Zoom? Okay. I think the internet just went out again. Okay. So folks, folks who missed that, my question for you all is just to take a moment to consider, do you know any communities who you're connected to who you could invite to join our repair network? And if you wanna share their names in the chat, um, would love to connect with you about reaching out to them together. Um, like I said, I'd want to empower folks to be, our, be your own ambassadors for the repair network and help us grow exponentially. Um, and if you haven't joined yet, what's your next step towards officially joining? Is it starting educa more education, doing a collective decision, having a conversation to discern if you're ready to join? So I'll pause there and see if you all have any suggestions. Anyone in the room wanna raise your hand? Who else should join? We'll pass the mic around while you all on Zoom are, are thinking about that or sharing in the chat. I just had a quick question, Katja, about um, is this, does this continue to be a Mennonite thing? And then when mm -hmm. and if like other non-Mennonite congregations or groups would be able to join if they wanted? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Right now we wanted to start out for the first year or two within the Mennonite church and kind of develop this and grow from here. But actually during our annual meeting this, this weekend on Sunday, we're gonna have a conversation about what does um, expanding ecumenically look like? And you, would we, how would we wanna do that or consider doing that? Especially considering that other um, denominations ecumenically are doing some of their own work around the doctrine of discovery. So how do we collaborate or partner together or invite them in? What does that look like? Um, so, so far it is Mennonite, and then we're, we're hoping to jump in those conversations this weekend, Todd. Yeah. A mi yeah, a Mennonite Catholic worker, bring both together. Well, I yeah. do think that some of us in the Mountain States area could certainly talk to other Mountain States. That would be certainly one thing we could do. So, so yes, Mountain States would love to have you all um, consider joining. We had a whole Mennonite conference, Allegheny Mennonite conference join, and now are engaging with their congregations about what that looks like to be members. So um, I'm gonna put the slide up again of those who have joined officially. And then Sylvia Shirk had a question about, is this limited to North America? That was a conversation at Mennonite World Conference. That is a great question. I would, I would love to see this expanded beyond, right now it's limited to um, the US is, what, is where we've been focusing because that's what we've grown out of. But we've got Canadians in the room here with us who are curious and we've connected with Steve Heinrichs and others up in Canada in the past about um, what does this look like to have a cross-border conversation like the map, you know, there these colonial borders are, um, don't follow the same um, territories of indigenous peoples. And if pipelines can cross borders, why can't our repair network? So any other questions or thoughts? Luke, anyone else? Sorry folks on Zoom, I think our internet is a little unstable again here. So Joanna's thinking of Fellowship of Hope Mennonite Church, recognizing some of the folks in the coalition are connected and maybe they're in process. Yeah, we've invited them to join the repair network calls, Joanna. And I think some of them may be here um, and in conversation as well. So I invite you to email me if you think of others and I would love to um, invite you if you do think of a church to reach out to them directly as well. Luke had a thought. Uh, so just a, a comment. Uh, so I'm Luke Gacho and I'm from Waterford Mennonite Church in Croatia, Indiana. And we're recognizing, so we're, we're on that other list, it's not on the screen, right, of churches in process. And I was just meeting with the leadership, uh, like the elder type group of the church and recognizing we wanna take enough time for the larger body of the church to be involved. 
Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we recognize it's probably not going to be until 2023 sometime where we actually feel comfortable even asking the church to, to say we will be a repair network mm -hmm. congregation. Mm -hmm. So being willing to be patient, I think that's why it's good to have churches in process. We have a whole group of people who are active in the coalition, um, some online here even uh, today. Yeah, in different ch church communities have different kinds of processes, like some churches, the leadership um, decided other churches, it takes a consensus decision making process. So we don't make a, you know, recommendation as a coalition about how or when to join, but ha getting your own sense of what's the level of kind of collective buy in and I think that's wise to take time and we're not going to like kick you off of joining and listening in the repair network calls. The point is that you're engaged and connected. And honestly, Luke, I kind of consider you all like a default repair network congregation. I'm always like surprised when Waterford yeah, hasn't joined. Uh, I mean, I guess another thought in this, knowing that some churches are going to take more time in processing, that maybe the map could be populated with in process churches mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Because people mm -hmm. are working really hard on this so issue. True. Uh, and so there could be reaching out to each other about this. Uh, so that might it, it might be good to have that second list posted. Yeah, yeah, that's a great suggestion. And in the past meetings, we've shared all the ones in process, but just because right now we don't have them on the map yet, we just shared the ones who've officially joined. But I think that'd be pretty easy to do, right, Hallie, to just include all the ones who are... Um, who are starting the process of conversation at least. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's keep moving forward. Thank you folks for input and suggestions on that. Um, I wanna share some short updates before we get into um, hopefully some time for conversation here about our, our campaigns with indigenous partners um, this year. We've been working with, um, like I mentioned, the Apache Stronghold. And as I shared earlier, when I was sharing the prayer, um, they are going, they're going to be appealing their um, case, to, which is a religious freedoms case, to stop the land transfer um, of Oak Flat to the copper mining company. They're appealing that all the way up to the Supreme Court. And it's not certain yet whether or not that will actually be heard by the Supreme Court but they're calling us to pray with them. And in the meantime, to also support the Save Oak Flat Act. And I'll share more information about that in email. And we also have a chance to um, next week, like I said, on the prayer and action call to actually call our congressional representatives and ask them to co-sponsor or thank them if they've already co-sponsored the Save Oak Flat Act, which would stop that land transfer. Um, Carol Rose has been really active and she started a committee around this in the coalition and you're welcome to join and listen in and learn more about what that committee is up to. One thing I'm really proud of about the Repair Network is that I felt like I saw you all come together in action last November when they had the Ninth Circuit um, Court of Appeals case in, in San Francisco. Um, the three different Repair Network congregations showed up all along the way of the Apache Caravan's journey. They started in Arizona and Shalom Mennonite Fellowship joined them for their send off. Carol was part of that blessing on their caravan's way. And then um, representatives from Pasadena Mennonite Church joined them in Southern California as, as they made their way up north to San Francisco and joined them in prayer and ceremony there. And then in San Francisco, um, um, First Mennonite Church of San Francisco um, joined and offered food and connected them with lodging in the city. Um, when they had their court hearing and showed up in, in peaceful vigil and protests there in San Francisco as well, um, and were able to connect, um, connect directly with the Apache Stronghold folks. So I felt like there was like a real interconnected effort from the Repair Network to, um, to respond to invitations to solidarity and to show up together with these co coalition partners. Um, another I think really cool way of connecting with Oak Flat happened recently when Gerald Ross Richer, who's a part of Waterford Mennonite Church, brought his Goshen College, um, I think it was called Indigenous Economics class out to Oak Flat. And they camped on site and were able to visit with um, some of the Apache Stronghold leaders and some local miners who are against the mine actually. And the students, um, 
we're, we're able to really um, be on the land, to feel the spiritual presence on the land there, um, to share questions. And I've actually um, invited one of the students to share a video, Teresa Ross Richer, and another student will be speaking tomorrow during our annual coalition gathering about just what they learned and some of their reflections on that. So I'll stop my share and maybe invite um, Jill, our tech person, to share this video of reflection from Oak Flat from Teresa. Zoom can't hear anything. I think we're still working it out. Here we go. Good afternoon, oh, okay. everyone. I'm honored to be here today and have this chance to share with all of you my experience staying at Oak Flat Campgrounds. I have the I had the privilege to do so this last summer with an ecological economics class with Goshen College. While at Oak Flat, we got the chance to meet with Wensler Nosey a native Apache leader and long distance runner. And as a runner myself, I'm excited to share with you what I learned about the Apache religious running traditions that Wensler shared with us. I'd like to read a piece that I wrote for this class about what I learned from Wensler about Apache running. I'm gonna go ahead and read that now. Settled in at our first campsite, a group of us scrambled up the desert rocks to watch the sunset and see what fascinating wildlife we could discover. Over the soft sound of the oak trees blowing in the wind, we spotted a black pickup truck pulling into the camp. This meant Wensler Nosley, a native Apache leader, was here and had come to talk with us. Wensler shared much involving the Apache people and their land. However, what stood out to me as a distance runner was what he shared about Apache religious running traditions. There is an intense sense of connection, communication, and a spiritual bond between the human and the earth as they run. In my understanding, an Apache begins their run by praying out loud to communicate to the animals and to the plants that they come in peace and bring no harm. The wildlife must know your intentions before feeling comfortable enough to reveal themselves. A soft breeze blew over us as Wensler explained the significance of the air and how both good and bad spirits coexist with one another. While running, Apache people become fully immersed in the spirits present in the air. Whether good or bad, the spirits cannot be seen, but while running they cling themselves to you. To finish off a run, Wensler so showed us how Apache people cleanse themselves from all the evil spirits that may have clung to them. With hands on his head, Wenzel drew them down to his feet in a sweeping motion and repeated this ritual four times. Running for the Apache people is more than just understanding the earth as dirt, plants, animals, and air, but knowing them each individually as spiritual beings full of life and dignity. Now when I run, I find myself more aware of the abundance of life before me, behind me and all around me. Thank you for giving me this time and allowing me to share some of what I learned from being at Oak Flat. Thank you. Yeah, Teresa. Some of you may know Teresa. Um, it was awesome to see more um, Goshen College students getting engaged in this struggle and um, hearing some of their reflections. And they posted um, some blogs that I'll share out with you afterwards that were really powerful from what their takeaways were. 
Um, the Apache Stronghold has invited anyone out to camp at Oak Flat. It's a public campground and they feel like the more visibility, the better and um, really want people to come and connect with that place um, in a respectful way. So if you're thinking about youth trips in the coming year or camping ideas for yourself or your congregation, something to keep in mind if you're able to. Um, I also just wanted to share a, a quick update from um, the Maya community who we've been partnering with, um, Kakushta Mushmayash. And um, like I shared on the last Repair Network call in June, we were able to accompany them um, to New York for the U United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues to present their uh, a statement that they were able to share there um, about the impacts on land and water who they see as spiritual beings um, deserving of protection and respect um, the impacts of uh, monoculture industrial agriculture in that region. Um, some of the key players in that region um, of these harmful impacts are actually Mennonite farmers, um, low German Mennonites in that, in that area. And um, they see them as, as pawns that the government is using and um, that are part of a larger scale uh, development scheme of, of economic um, extraction from their area for, um, for neo-colonial um, projects, development projects um, that don't benefit ultimately the Maya people and that aren't happening there with their consent. Um, another one of these projects is the Maya train, a train being planned through that region. So we're standing um, in support with them and seeking pathways to connect with um, Mennonite communities there right now through a low German newspaper um, and are trying to find ways to um, um, to continue to support their, their sovereignty as peoples, um, peoples who are seeking to, to pass on the, their heirloom seeds. And they've actually shared a short video with us that they've asked to share with the coalition as, a, as their own way of updating us about um, our partnership and what it means to them and their work. Um, and so I'll invite, a, let's see, Lars and Jill to share that next video from Kakushta. Malop king, in wet kikesh, yet el sukunesh, ya le coalición menonita social, ujutul le doctrina tie descubrimiento. Tushtik tesh, kimak ola el tulak lilon kakushtal, weyhop echen campech, México. Los impactos de la doctrina del descubrimiento, incluyendo el robo y la pérdida de tierras, las relaciones rotas y la asimilación cultural, son parte de nuestra historia como menonitas, ya sea que seamos gente de color y o descendientes de colonos blancos. Nuestras historias aquí, en la isla Tortuga, nos llevan a lamentar las continuas heridas del colonialismo y a clamar a Dios por sanación y justicia. Con este poderoso mensaje en las redes sociales, la coalición Menonita captó en octubre de 2018 nuestra atención desde las comunidades mayas en Jopelchen, Campeche, en México. Desde entonces, hemos caminado juntas y juntos compartiendo un mismo sueño, desmantelar la doctrina del descubrimiento y buscar la justicia en la tierra, cada una y uno a nuestro modo y tiempo, como dicen las compas zapatistas. A nuestros modos y tiempos nos hemos mantenido en el camino por casi cuatro años. Nuestros primeros acercamientos consistían en reunirnos esporádicamente. Al principio Caterina Frisen y Manuel May, y más tarde se fueron integrando más compañeras y compañeros de las comunidades mayas y de la coalición menonita. Poco a poco, a paso seguro, la familia fue creciendo. Uno de nuestros primeros temas de conversación fue la relación de convivencia que tenemos las comunidades mayas con las colonias menonitas en Jopelchen. Ello ayudó a conocernos mejor con la coalición y nos llevó a juntarnos para reflexionar sobre la teología detrás de nuestras luchas. Todo ello para desmantelar la doctrina del descubrimiento y para defender a la madre tierra, la madre naturaleza y la sagrada agua. En nuestra lucha nos une la responsabilidad moral con las obras y los espíritus de la creación. A finales del año 2021, Kakustal y la coalición Menonita coorganizamos tres webinarios sobre el desmantelamiento de la doctrina del descubrimiento, 
donde hemos invitado a varias hermanas y hermanos indígenas, aliadas y aliados, para estudiar en profundidad hasta dónde nos sigue afectando esta doctrina, como pueblo maya que somos. También estamos trabajando en varios artículos en conjunto con miembros de la coalición Menonita y Cacustal, que van a poner sobre la mesa los problemas que seguimos enfrentando los pueblos mayas que están conectados con la doctrina del descubrimiento. En 2022, la coalición de Nonita eligió a Cacustal como socio de reparación en el trabajo de sanar las heridas causadas por la colonización. ¿Qué es lo que queremos celebrar este último año? Celebramos la vida juntas y juntos. Celebramos nuestras luchas y caminares juntas. Juntos. Celebramos y defendemos a la Sagrada Agua. Celebramos que el Gran Espíritu, la Madre Naturaleza y el Creador han cruzado nuestros caminos, los de Cacustal y los de la coalición Menonita, todo con el objetivo de desmantelar la doctrina del descubrimiento. It was really exciting to hear um, that voice over in Maya. Um, we were able to meet the young woman who's been um, actually turning some of the webinar series that we collaborated with them on into a podcast to go out to Maya speaking rural communities in their area um, about the doctrine of discovery and sharing some of the connections with the ongoing colonization that they're experiencing all in her native Maya language. So um, another fruit of, of that collaboration. So I wanted to just pause to see if anyone has comments or questions as I've shared about these two coalition partners um, from the past year, years. And Lars is in the room, who's actually the chair of the Maya Solidarity Committee. So if you have anything you'd like to add to that, Lars, feel free. Great. Any other comments or questions, thoughts? We're, sh we're really sharing with you, this with you all because you are the repair network representative. So when someone comes up to you in your congregation, it's like, what is that coalition? What are they doing? Who are the indigenous peoples they're working with? You get to be that bridge person who's sharing and explaining. I see Elizabeth on the call. It was awesome to meet um, Elizabeth Yepes in New York where Kakushtal came and shared. Representatives um, from their community came and were able to share with that congregation. And that's one of the beauties of being part of a repair network is directly, when possible, connecting people um, with the campaigns we're supporting. So thank you, Manhattan Mennonite Fellowship. Well, if there aren't any other comments or questions on those campaigns, I did wanna announce, um, so our past annual indigenous repair partner was Kakushtal, um, who just shared that video um, from the Maya community. And 60% of the coalition's general fund donations go towards an annual indigenous repair partner who coalition members nominate and um, the steering committee decides on each year. And this year, um, we're actually focusing trading off international and domestic repair partners so far. This year, it's um, the, the Apache Stronghold um, partners at Oak Flat. And so 60% of all general fund donations, so if your congregations are donating as part of your commitment to being part of the, part of the repair network, we believe that as a mostly um, settler coalition, that's our responsibility to return some of the, the wealth and funds that come to our coalition from a lot of Mennonite congregations towards impacted communities who are impacted by the doctrine of discovery. Um, all of us are impacted, of course, but indigenous communities still experiencing that dispossession. So I'm seeing comments in the chat from Sylvia. Um, any updates on how the Mennonite colonies respond or are connecting with the dismantling the doctrine of discovery or with the doctrine of discovery? Um, at this point, we have like very initial kind of um, starting step communication connections through a newspaper that goes out to those colonies. Right now, we don't have direct connections. So um, that's something that's sensitive and delicate work. And if you wanna get, get involved, we're asking people to get engaged through our committee, through the My Solidarity Committee, because we recognize how sometimes um, isolated those communities have been and how easy it would be for us to make cultural 
um, errors that could damage relationships with the Maya community. But we do wanna seek to reach out and to make connections. So if you do have connections, we welcome those and have been actually working with Annika um, Rayner, an intern this summer to, um, to bring in Canadian Mennonites and others with connections to low German Mennonite communities to inform us on best practices for reaching out. So that's all that I'll share at this point. I don't know if you wanna say more, Lars. Uh, Mike, yes. Lars has another Hi. response, Sylvia. This is Lars. Um, just worth noting that as Kathy Stahl mentioned, this relationship with the coalition predates this mm -hmm. annual repair partner relationship and it will continue beyond it. Um, so we will be continuing to work with Kathy Stahl in this effort. Yep. Yeah, and with all of our the repair partners so far, we continue to be in relationships. That's a good note. It's not just an annual kind of one-time thing. Joanna shared in the chat, it was such a gift to our congregation to get to provide food for the Apache Stronghold in October in, in San Francisco. Those of us who accompanied with food for three days were so inspired by their love, generosity, moral vision, and clarity of purpose. And Joanna, you preached the, um, a pretty rad sermon on um, Wensler Nosey's mysticism that I wanna post on our blog. So thank you for sharing that out too with your congregation. Um, and Eileen has shared on Sunday, October 9th, um, Gerald Rasvitcher and some students will speak at 8th Street Mennonite Church about their experience camping at Oak Flat. So those are, of you who are in that area are invited to attend from 1045 to 1130. You can see the details in the chat. That's awesome. I'm so glad that those students are able to share out their experiences um, within the Goshen Elkhart area. I love seeing that, that spreading happening. I wanted to share a quick kind of, um, I guess, heads up, something to be attuned to as a repair network. Before we started the repair network, some of you may have involved, been involved years ago, probably in 2017, 2018, with vigils around the Indian Child Welfare Act. Who here has heard of the, of the Indian Child Welfare Act or ICWA? Wow, a lot of people in this room, some people, I'm seeing a lot of hands on Zoom. Um, so, so what is the Indian Child Welfare Act? Our coalition was invited to respond, and so we called on Mennonite congregations to respond to this. Anybody want to jump in in the room and share what is ICWA or the Indian Child Welfare Act? You can have a mic if you'd like. Or on Zoom, if you want to unmute and share, if you remember what is ICWA from what you remember learning during that time or before. So Luke has his hand up, yeah. Uh, so a, a very basic understanding of it uh, was a decision made back in the mid uh, 1970s mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, children from indigenous families would be placed in foster care within indigenous families. That's kind of the core uh, of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was resistance to that by people saying, well, well it was white people saying, we, we still can provide foster care. And that's what brought it to the, uh, it, which number court system. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the prayer vigil uh, standing in solidarity uh, time back uh, in 2017. Yeah, 2017, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Luke. Yeah, that's right on. So it was, um, it is a federal law and it came out in the 1970s, I think 1978 as part of key civil rights legislation protecting indigenous children because they saw that high numbers were being removed from their families under um, social services by public and also private agencies for foster care or adoptions and being placed in non-indigenous families. Continuing patterns of removal that communities trace back to the boarding school um, era and times of separating indigenous people, indigenous peoples from one another and tearing communities apart. And so um, there have been challenges to this a couple of years back. And now again, there are more challenges that are continuing. And some of these are from Christian groups, actually. So this is some of um, our invitation from partners with the with national, I think it's the um, 
oh, it's called NICWA, but I forget what the acronym stands for. We'll have to look back. I had never um, heard of ICWA before this. So this was a big learning curve for me and I think a lot of Mennonite congregations to learn what this represented and how we could stand with indigenous communities to support um, keeping um, native children in their homes and, and um, standing in the way of this kind of, this continued removal um, process or, or in their communities, finding alternative homes with other indigenous families whenever possible is part of this law. So we've been tr tracking this and Sarah Augustine is especially attuned. So stay tuned for updates because the Supreme Court has said that they will hear the challenges. And with the um, climate of the Supreme Court right now, it's uncertain about how this will go. And so we may be calling on you all again to vigil, to pray, um, to stand up for the Indian Child Welfare Act with our partners at NICWA. Um, and in the future, if you have campaigns that you want to recommend from groups who you're in relationship with, feel free to reach out. But those are some of the ones that we're involved with from the coalition. Um, so I want to kind of transition right now. I know we've been sharing a lot of updates, a lot of um, coalition related news. Um, my final pitch to you all um, is to join the prayer and action calls, which you're already part, you know, many of you are already a part of. And then also we have a fall book study happening of healing haunted histories, a uh, um, settler discipleship of decolonization with Elaine Entz. And um, she invites us to dig deep into our own personal family stories of displacement and migration and to connect those stories with larger system stories of colonization and how we've been impacted by that or been a complicit in that as well um, in order to more fully um, claim our own sense of identity and, and um, stand more deeply with indigenous peoples and struggles for decolonization. So it's some deep inner work. And I think the inner will be reflected in the outer. The deeper that we go internally, the more we'll be able to show up uh, more fully alongside indigenous partners. So I've sent out a flyer about that. Um, August 1st is the deadline for registering. Um, and then our next quarterly call as a repair network will be just before Indigenous Peoples Day on October 6th from 4 to 6 p.m. So we don't have a ton of time for what I was hoping could be some breakout room discussions. But I do just want to get us thinking about these questions now, because our next call isn't until almost Indigenous Peoples Day. I feel like Indigenous Peoples Day and the transition away from calling it Columbus Day, due to a lot of us awesome organizing by Indigenous and other BIPOC communities, um, has, has meant this kind of celebration of Indigenous resilience and genius and ways that we can support both locally and globally Indigenous peoples' um, sovereignty and, and, and struggles today. So what could we do as church communities? How could you all organize around, um, I think it's October 11th, I want to say this year, or is it October 12th? Sorry, folks. October 10th. Thank you, Luke. Um, so yes, it is a, it's a Monday the 10th. Is there something that your church community could do around Indigenous Peoples Day? Or how could you be thinking about supporting our coalition's campaigns is that something that you want to integrate into worship, maybe um, a special service in your congregation, a public witness? Um, I know some folks are calling on their local cities to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day instead of Columbus Day. So let's just like take a pause moment for a minute here and just sit with that. And if there's anyone who wants to come on screen or unmute who has an idea about um, how you might organize around it, how we might organize around that, um, or even what resources you'd like to see in connection with Indigenous Peoples Day ideas. I'll just pause and see instead of breakout rooms, what bubbles up from the room right now. Any thoughts from this room that, we're, that I'm standing in right now around Indigenous Peoples Day? Have folks organized around it in the past? What might we do this year? I know Sarah Nahar, you've been part of some, um, some statue transitions. <laughs> Would you like to share? Sarah Nahar and Baby Balan are in the room. 
Okay. So one thing I think that we could do would be to recognize that Christianity is an indigenous wisdom tradition from Palestine. And what does it mean for us to, the majority of us, to not be indigenous to Palestine, nor indigenous to here, and yet adherence to this wisdom tradition? How do we think about where we live now versus the watershed in which the text was formed and written? and felt into. So it could just be a matter of building on what is in healing haunted histories by thinking about what your watershed is teaching you. Because like Jesus discipled himself to his watershed. So it could be something like that. Or it could be connecting the struggles of the people of Palestine with the struggles of indigenous peoples here to look at global indigenous struggle. Some of those things could happen on the Sunday closest to indigenous mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And yes, take down any Columbus statues that are in your city, along with mm -hmm. everyone else who's trying to help remove them to make public spaces more um, open and less symbolically violent. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Great suggestions. We're having uh, difficulty hearing people on the handheld mics on Zoom. So if other people would just go up to the front and stand at the pulpit, we appreciate that. Hello all, um, my name is Todd Winward. I became a Mennonite here uh, about 24 years ago. Um, I'm up in the Taos, uh, upper Rio Grande watershed right near Taos Pueblo. And one of the things I think that I've learned uh, kind of piggybacking on what Sarah just said is the examining what it means to be a person of place for us who have settled somewhere, those of us who have come to a new place. There's a lot of surrendering that needs to happen if we settle well somewhere, including realizing we're guests but the change of our own behaviors might be a, a, a sweet spot for those of us who are part of a confessional and atoning Mennonite and a Baptist tradition, the notion of how do we need to atone for our own behavior and how might we learn to become naturalized citizens of a place. I've done a little writing and work about that uh, in the upper Rio Grande watershed um, where there's layers of conquistador and, and settler layers on top of an existing a watershed based people. And so what does it mean to be, as Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about, she says, at any moment, you can lay down the mindset of the colonizer. And it just kind of blew me away. It was like, at any moment, we can stop trying to perpetuate those patterns and look at our own hearts. So if that was something of interest, I have a few thoughts. I looked at the INS website for immigration and naturalization services inspired by what Robin Wall Kimmerer wrote, and there's about eight things that one does to become a naturalized citizen of the United States. And I've, I've tried to adapt them to what would it mean eight things for me to do in my watershed if I chose to be, try to be a naturalized citizen. And they have to do with the well being and contributing to the benefit of the whole, um, to learn the laws of the land, things like that. So it could be a thing that we choose to do in a way that humbles ourselves and lets Native people know that we're serious to try to be watershed people among many other beings. Just an idea if that was of interest. Thank you, Todd, for those suggestions. And Sarah, I'm hearing echoes of learning to um, immerse ourselves more deeply into the places where we call home, as well as recognizing the wisdom traditions that we're grafted into. Um, from Jewish Palestinian traditions and also seeking solidarity with Palestine as part of our work in decolonial struggles. And I think we've got some great leadership in the room around um, that kind of work here too that we can draw from and pull from, especially Jonathan and Sarah Nahar. And I also see um, Joanna shared a resource in the chat, um, a blog of a sermon, and then Andrew has shared Indigenous Peoples Days 
falls during the festival of Sukkot. I've been thinking of some sort of harvest celebration. Surely there is a tie-in to decolonization. That is um, an interesting, yeah, draw in and tie in of different festivals and um, ways to, finding ways also to recognize and honor the, the Jewish roots of that. I'd be interested in being in conversation with Jewish folks too around what honoring that um, tradition looks like. So thanks folks for your ideas. If you wanna be part of like a small group huddle even of what Indigenous Peoples Day recognition could look like from the coalition, what kind of um, collective organizing we can do, reach out to me and we can continue exploring some of the, these ideas. Todd, your resources that you offered, let's keep on being in conversation about this, but just wanted to open it up to the group to get your wisdom and um, brainstorm on that. So we're gonna transition right now to a time of sharing from two repair network communities. Really what we like to do on these calls is include time to spark imagination among us for what's going on um, in other communities in our network and how can we challenge each other, stir our vision for what's possible, um, think of new ways of, um, of relating um, with land and with indigenous peoples towards um, towards justice and so and right remembrance as um, folks in the Goshen Elkhart community are doing. So I'm going to invite um, Luke up to share. And while he's doing that, if you just want to take a stretch break wherever you are, you can just stand and he's going to get his PowerPoint going here. And I'll transition over while you stretch. So I think it, I think it, um, if we can't see that yeah. on the screen, like the sidebar of the people, uh -huh. it, it's not it's not really a problem for the people in the room. Yeah, right? no, it's not a problem. Oh. I'm just sorry, so I don't know if it's on Zoom. We should still see you. I think so. Maybe Let's just try. give this a try. You can just save it. You'll open it up for Q and then we'll do five okay. minutes of it. Sure. And I think, uh, yeah, I can actually, I can see the time here, which is good. Um, oh, yeah. It's. Well, greetings uh, to everyone. Um, it's good to be able to share with you this afternoon what I would call a case study. And when I think about uh, the concept of case study, I, I think of uh, something that's in process or has happened and how we can learn from that. And in our case, since it's still happening, um, as I share about this particular activity in the Potawatomi, uh, Miami, area of northern Indiana, the Elkhart St. Joseph watershed. Um, it's interesting to be doing that from a different watershed here uh, across, the, uh, across the virtual network. So may this uh, time of sharing this case study be helpful to you, and uh, we'll have some Q&A time at the end. So I'm going to begin by just sharing a little bit of how I um, was motivated to become involved in this. There are a lot of other details of motivation for me related to working on the Dismantling Doctrine of Discovery work, uh, but this is one particular piece. So on the screen, uh, you see that it says, imagine 1830. And so 1830 uh, is uh, an interesting marker year in several ways uh, in Northern Indiana. 
Just two years before this, the uh, treaty with the Potawatomi had been signed uh, and settlers started showing up in 1829. And now I'm saying, imagine 1830. So this is what it would have looked like in the summer of 1829 and 1830, uh, where I live. This is called an oak savanna. So you have larger oak trees, you've got these uh, native grasses and flowers that are underneath um, this area. But in 1830, a post was set in this savanna area. And the surveyors who set this post, in the process of preparing for selling the land, measured the distance to these two oak trees and wrote that down in a journal. That's an interesting thing uh, to think about, because if we fast forward to 2022, you see the arrow where my home is, where my fruit nut and berry orchard is off on the right side of the screen. And the post that I was just talking about was put right there in the middle of what is now a very busy intersection. The post is obviously not there anymore, but the county surveyor's office knows that exact spot mapping, right, Haley? You know where those spots have been, been noted. And so as I was trying to understand the land that I tend there in Goshen, Indiana, and spend a lot of time in this wonderful two and a half acres, uh, I think about people who were in this area before, and what do we know about this land? So in the process of trying to understand this, I came across in the Elkhart County Surveyor's Office this document, 500 and some odd pages of handwritten cursive notes that the surveyors wrote down in 1829 and 1830, indicating where this happened. And most likely uh, in, in the majority of our states, in the state archives, you could find this. There just happened to be a copy of this in our local uh, county surveyor's office. And it's fun to figure out how to read the, the writing, the cursive writing, and we're not gonna go through detail here, but what I am highlighting here is the description of the oak trees, the size of the oak trees, where they were located when they put that post at the corner of our uh, property, what is now our property. And also, if you keep reading, the surveyors started heading east along that way, and they entered the prairie. So they left a savanna and entered a prairie area, which is called the Elkhart Prairie. We also know in looking at this record that as you continued east, you they encountered and marked down a road to Fort Wayne. Well, this road to Fort Wayne is actually a millennial old road that moved from the Maumee watershed, which is where Fort Wayne is located, all the way to what we now call Chicago and Lake Michigan. And it passed right within a half a mile of where I live. Uh, so this was kind of a sobering thing to recognize. So when I take the information uh, that I've gathered and I look at a satellite image, my home here, Goshen College there, Greencroft Retirement Center here, and I match this, I recognize that all of this area in the green uh, is a prairie area. To the left of that is savanna area. You see the Elkhart River uh, to the left of the side of the screen. And this trail is passing right through the city of Goshen, going right through the Greencroft property itself. So these are a number of motivational things. Maps were drawn up in the 1830s to represent this. And if you look closely at this map, you will see that it marks this Indian trail moving down through here. And here's where I live. Over here is where the trail uh, is, is passing. And you see Assembly Mennonite Church. You see 8th, 8th Street uh, Mennonite Church listed there as well. And so what I have done is I've started doing overlays uh, of GIS mapping that the county has with these old maps and thinking about where does this trail actually go? Well, over time, uh, you know, as I gathered this information and looked at these maps that describe all the um, geographic features and the, the trees around the edge of this one mile by one mile square, uh, people heard me talk about this and I would talk about this trail. 
And I was learning as being a part of the coalition. So for example, if you look at the repair network resource guide, we have some back here on the table or they're available online. One of the persons who was an, a very helpful advisor to us was Dr. Randy Woodley. And he shared this paradigm, uh, and many of you have seen this before, but he, he's very clear that our land acknowledgement work is only a very, very early toe in the water kind of thing in this process. And so he worked on this paradigm where he said, yes, we need awareness. We need more education to happen. We also need to spend appropriate times in lament. And then we need to work on reparations or what he also calls rehumanizing a very important step, and then forth to memorialize. And this is really a, a cyclical thing. It's not that you, you have to start one point and go all the way around, but it's, it's a learning that happens all across this. So combining what I was learning about the landscape where I lived, along with the um, trail passing through it, thinking through things that the coalition is working on, a process started to emerge. So I had been speaking about Potawatomi uh, and Miami uh, peoples and the settler histories in our region, I started saying, you know, maybe one of the things we could do at the end of my presentations is to mark this trail. And people would stop by my little orchard when I was out there working and saying, so Luke, when are you going to start working on that? It's like, oh, okay, I guess they're hearing what I'm saying. Uh, and so that suggestion just kept coming up over and over again, that this could be a reparative action. This could be a way of memorializing, as you see in uh, the paradigm that uh, Randy has shared with us. And so in April of 2021, I contacted some of the people who said, when are you going to start working on this? And I said, guess what? Uh, we are going to start being a working group or a committee uh, to start on this. And so uh, I think right now there are about uh, eight or nine of us who are working together we have um, monthly Zoom meetings to try to understand the process. Uh, another thing that we have done is we have engaged with Potawatomi and Miami leaders in thinking through this, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, but we did that very early on. Uh, Potawatomi and Miami leaders have been very helpful with insights and also uh, gratitude. Uh, we're not a, we're not a nonprofit organization, and, and people wanted to give us money to help put up signs. It's like okay, and so we established a relationship with Mennonite Central Committee Great Lakes, which happens to have its offices in Goshen. One of the persons who works there is on our committee, and so we have accounts there. And when we have a few bills that we have to pay or receive money, uh, they're managing it at least for a couple of years. And so we've been working at designing uh, a logo. We've been working on cons uh, for like a, a, a trail marker sign, uh, kiosk, and uh, working on a website. So actually, uh, just before I came out here, the web designer said, okay, we've got the design ready that you've approved, uh, and we can now start populating it with information, uh, which, uh, which will start happening uh, later this month and, and then on in uh, through August, et cetera. So here's uh, the draft design, which is probably the one we are going to use. So on the left, you see the Potawatomi Miami Trail or Potawatomi Miami Trail. Chicago, Fort Wayne are noted there. The QR code, if you're pointing your phone at this, it doesn't work because it's not linked to what our website will be, uh, but that will be happening. We also have uh, some kiosk designs that are in process. So we may just have some marker boards with a little bit more information or maybe a kiosk that where you could sit uh, in an area and take that in, uh, which, which is good. So some of you are familiar with other major routes across the United States and other places that get marked, right? The Lincoln Highway, right? Route 66, and you get all this stuff. Well, the Lincoln Highway, some of it in Northern Indiana runs on top of this trail. Uh, this trail will not be one that you can walk on because it runs through all kinds of private, private property on, or on roadways you would not want to walk or shouldn't walk, safe, couldn't walk safely on. This sign is an interesting um, reminder of what one can learn in early conversation with indigenous people. So when we were having conversations by Zoom with the people in Oklahoma who are 
Potawatomi descendants of people who were forced on the trail of death from our area. So they live there, their cultural center is there. And so we have had Zoom meetings and email correspondence with them. And one of the persons said, uh, I, we had a, a mock-up of our, our sign that said Potawatomi Miami Trail. And they said, why not use the indigenous words themselves uh, for this. So even while they haven't used it yet in their own uh, like website, et cetera, here's a brand new opportunity to do this. And what this does, it's one of those acts of decolonizing uh, the, the whole concept that, that's going on. And uh, so as Blake talked about this, it was very helpful to do that, working at finding the, the, the right or best spelling for some of these things, making the font bigger, right? is another signal uh, that, okay, if you don't know what that means, yes, it is the Potawatomi Miami Trail, but it's, it's kind of like a parenthetical instead. Um, so just wonderful learnings uh, that have happened like that. And just uh, a week, uh, week and a half ago, Blake sent me a note saying, yep, that's the right way that we spell Potawatomi in, in the Potawatomi language, but not every Potawatomi group spells it the same, right? So you kind of have to pick and, and uh, make those kinds of decisions. Uh, it was also interested in, in, interested, interesting in working uh, with Blake and um, who's the curator there in Shawnee, Oklahoma uh, and Kelly Mostoller. So Dr. Mostoller has been the director uh, of their center, their cultural heritage center has done a phenomenal job. And some, a few groups, Katerina, at least some groups on the Trail of Death pilgrimage have seen and met her uh, as well. She just sent me a note about three weeks ago saying, sorry, I've been kind of slow in responding to you, but I'm leaving. Uh, and so she's leaving that role. She's been contacted and is now becoming the director of the North American uh, or the Native American uh, Center at Harvard University. So she has a new role where she can speak into a lot of issues. And so uh, one of the things I learned from her was that she and Blake had written an article in this particular book. So this book is called Interpretive, Na Interpreting Native American History and Culture um, at Museums and Historic Sites. So I got that book because I wanted to glean how do they say we should work on this? And so it's been very helpful. Uh, you can look up this book, hear some stuff about the case studies they present, the ways they are helpful. Um, and so Kelly and Blake wrote chapter three. Let me just note a couple learnings from chapter three, which talks specifically about consultation with tribes and advice from the field. Uh, so for example, they say, when beginning a new project or seeking consultation from a tribe, the most important step is to establish a relationship with key, a key individual or group from the community. Another quote, things such as tribal seals and other identifiers of a sovereign nation need to be used exclusively for the group they represent. You don't just go in and grab their logo and throw it on something you're doing. We, we, we're not going to do that and wouldn't do that related to our signs. Um, the history of the citizen Potawatomi nation, they write, in our home territory, uh, which is like Goshen Elkhart area, Northern Indiana, ends with removal. However, museums in our ancestral territory need to continue our story into Kansas and Indian territory, Oklahoma, because this is part of the whole story. So, that I, so, so often we lose and act like the indigenous people no longer exist or have no presence or all these other things that are very diminutive in our conversation or historical remembrances. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last quote from them is museums will have greater success partnering with tribes uh, if they start a project working with tribal consultants to create ideas and themes together and share ownership from the beginning. And so Kelly and Blake have expressed appreciation that we contacted them very early. Uh, Diane Hunter from the Miami tribe um, of Oklahoma has said the same thing. You're contacting me like right at the very beginning. You don't even have signs up yet. Yes, that's right. And she said, that's good. I mean, so rather than saying, oh, we have a sign. What do you think of this? Instead, we could have that conversation. And, um, and that was a helpful piece. Uh, 
So here's an interesting example of working with two different tribal groups and a group of white settlers trying to figure out what we should do in terms of a logo. So we knew we couldn't and didn't want to take individual logos, right? And we asked both the Miami and Potawatomi, do you have graphic designers who could help do this for us? Well, they said, you know, we're, we're so busy with all our projects. We don't really have anybody to help us. We have a graphic, we happen to have a graphic designer on our committee. And so she began creating mock-ups and sending them off and we would get responses. So in this, we have representation from both Potawatomi and Miami in so pretty interesting ways. And both groups have said, yes, this is good. So for example, uh, in the inner part, the inner circle, you have the medicine wheel colors in the order that the Potawatomi have them. And on the outside are the colors in the way the Miami use them. It makes it beautiful, right? Uh, it, and it would have been harder for their graphic designers to do this combination. So they were kind of glad that sort of a, a neutral person <laughs> was helping to pull these ideas together. Another thing is I remember when Diane Hunter uh, looked at an earlier version and these strawberries that you see on the side here, which is a Potawatomi uh, important uh, fruit and flower. Um, she said, yeah, the Potawatomi are always using these floral designs. And I said, well, so Diane, what do you use? Well, we use ribbon work. That's what you see on the outside. And the Sandhill Crane is important to us. So, um, you see the sandhill cranes in here, you see the ribbon work here, you see a, a turtle design here that was based off of one that a, a Potawatomi person uh, had drawn. So lots of interesting things uh, that one can do together. Uh, and it would not work so well if you waited way into the process to try to do this. So let me just highlight a couple of learnings and challenges and then they'll take a couple of questions. So one of the things is to learn to take time. I mean, I could have been out there putting up a sign months ago, right? But no, that would not have been the right thing. Uh, and so we have to remind ourselves of that periodically as a committee. Engage well with the Potawatomi Miami leaders. Um, you know, and so one of the things that I recognize is both Kelly is now gone and, and fortunately we still have a contact with Blake, but there's, there's gonna be some new relationship building. The Pokagon Band of Potawatomi, just north of us in Michigan, they've just had a change in their cultural history leader person that I had worked with before. But so we want to keep the, building those relationships with key uh, people. Um, one also has to discern how does this fit into the larger city, state, county kinds of systems related to signage, because if you start putting up signs without getting zoning approvals, then you, you start having these adversarial relationships with mostly settler people about this message you're trying to tell. And so then that can also feel like it slows us down a little bit, but we keep gathering data about that. So the process is dialogue, develop and implement, debrief, regroup, uh, and keep working toward your goal. Um, and then draw people in through attractive and credible learning activities, which is one of the ways to keep the adversarial relationship from happening early. All right, uh, what kind of questions do we have? Um, oh, by the way, in my orchard, I did put up a sign acknowledging that when I'm working out here, that I am not the first person to have gardened in this space because the Potawatomi in Miami had done that for a long time, Potawatomi uh, most recently. So questions from in the room or anybody uh, on Zoom who wants to um, chime in? Yes, yeah, Haley. Sure. So the question is, are we able to have like trail, like trail in parts of that? Um, one of the places that we have one place in particular that this can probably happen. So the Mennonite church offices in Elkhart, Indiana, and the Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary in Elkhart, Indiana are adjoining properties. And where you enter between the two of those, it just so happens the trail enters there and continues on across the seminary property. 
And so right now, uh, like by Tuesday, I need to write a supporting letter for a grant that they're writing so that they can have a kiosk and additional signage so they can have a trail all the way through their property and don't need to go through a bunch of these hoops. And even the on-campus signage doesn't have to go through the same level of scrutiny. So I think if we can get a number of those to happen, uh, that'll be helpful. Uh, I've had conversations with our county parks people and one of our county parks has a piece of the trail going through it. So that'd be another place. Uh, so you're not impinging, telling a landowner, hey, we're gonna come and take land away from you uh, and create friction that way. So yes, good question. Yes. Well, that's true. So in, in Goshen, there is a bike trail on an old railroad uh, way. And so the huge amounts of challenges of purchasing. So in this case, they want it to be walkable and bikeable. Uh, and so you, you have to go through all those land acquisition processes. Uh, you know, we're focusing on Elkhart County, but we have at least... Uh, the trail would be in at least probably six to eight other counties. So we're hoping that we can create a model and then maybe some other counties will replicate that. So yes, we're, that's one of the things. We're, so the question was, um, what kind of information are we going to put up at different places? Is it the same or different? Our idea is that each kiosk would have a separate set of information because you'd be at a different point in the trail in a different relationship to an ecosystem or the river. So we can talk about that. And so, for example, Blake, who's the curator for the Potawatomi uh, Citizen um, Nation in Oklahoma said, we can give you real stories of real people to put up there. So what is the voice we are going to use in the stories that are shared? So it can't just, it can't just be a settler generated text. Uh, so again, we'll be working that way. Um, hopefully one of the things we can do is on the website, create a map where people could actually drive around and realize when they're crossing the trail, if they would have their GPS on, and maybe we'll get somebody to make an app that would help connect that. So they would know where it passes through the area. Uh, another place that it passes is through the Green Crop Retirement Center. And so um, that's going to be a little longer process, but there is some conversation going on there. Uh, it also happens to go right through the Elkhart County Courthouse property in downtown Goshen. And it'd be a wonderful place to do. There's a big green lawn, you know, uh, there are a number of, what should I say, political issues that would have to be addressed because I, we've already had people say, just by naming, even though I get this data from the county where these points of crossing are on the section lines, somehow telling this story makes people think political. You're, you're trying to do uh, political restructuring here and we're not interested in that. So anyway, a lot of good work. There's a question in the chat. So uh, the question uh, in the chat is, how did uh, we discern which, what leaders to contact? Um, so we looked for people who were involved in cultural and historical work within both of these tribal nation groups. And so we were able to find uh, those connections pretty easily on the, the internet. Uh, and I mean, I know I, I talked to Katerina because she had been in contact with Kelly Mostoller in Oklahoma already. Uh, so working with people who are in leadership roles within the tribal groups we knew uh, was an important uh, way to approach this as well. Thank you so much, Luke. I'll just add to that last one that um, for federally recognized tribes, many have like tribal governments that are set up like a government with like bureaucratic and administrative levels that you can pretty easily find on the website. You're not always guaranteed that they'll respond back, but Kelly Mosteller was really generous with her time in my experience. Yeah. Uh, so we're gonna transition now, unless you had any no, final sure. things. 
Thank you, Luke. We'll give Luke a hand. So what I, what I hope to communicate in these kind of stories that we share on Repair Network calls is the kind of breadth of possibility that's very contextual and local of ways of engaging in that kind of cycle that Luke shared of, of education, lament, memorializing. You know, I see this as kind of an acknowledgement project of a right remembrance project of whose lands are we walking on and what's the deep time history there and ongoing presence, um, ways of presencing. Like it's interesting that people's reaction is, is this political? To which I'd probably say, yes, <laughs> you know, it is a political issue, a political project. Mm -hmm. And and yet it's such a, it, you know, it's a it's a beginning level step for people to, to um, shift perspective in the lands where we um, where we walk and roll and sing and play every day. So the next project that I want to share. Oh yeah, go ahead, Luke. Let, let me just say that um, two things. One is if you look around and dig, you most likely can find trails close to where you mm -hmm. live um, that may be under roadways or whatever. So there are other things to acknowledge uh, too. And secondly, is some of our congregations are likely to put up a sign on in their property that points toward the trail and maybe says it's a mile away or a half mile away. So it won't be right on the trail, but there are multiple ways that we can engage that way. That's great. Thank you, Luke. So we have a note of thanks from George and Karen for your excellent presentation. Um, and we have a question and we'll, we'll maybe let Luke um, reach out directly with George and Karen that says, can you speak about the steps that we are taking to introduce this work to the congregation? Oh, and hopefully get more people involved. Um, so we don't have uh, time for that now because we need to transition. But what I will do is share Luke's information if you're open to that in a follow-up email. And if you're interested in um, hearing more, and maybe maybe Luke could even share a little bit about the steps of in involving the whole congregation in this work um, as a model for other folks to perhaps follow in, in similar kind of projects or consulting work. Um, I'd like to transition for the next 20 minutes and John stays and um, Doe, if you're on the call, if you'll leave the last couple minutes, Carol Rose has just come into the room on a long drive from Arizona and has an update from meeting with Oak Flat leaders that she wanted to share with you all at the very end. So if you'll just leave a few minutes, five minutes at the very end, but I'll turn it over now to um, John stays and to Doe Hoyer or whoever else is sharing from the Twin Cities Repair Network community about your ongoing partnership with Makoche Ikichupe, which was our 2019 repair partner for the coalition. And they've been maintaining and growing a, a really beautiful relationship of um, partnership in terms of labor and reparative justice support of their work towards Dakota land justice. So over to you, John, and I'll share my screen whenever you're ready. Sure. Um... You can go ahead and start the screen sharing whenever you are ready, Katerina. So like all repair congregations and repair communities, um, each one is unique and each one responds to you know, its own situation. And so in Minnesota, uh, most of Minnesota is Dakota homeland. And so we as, a, as the Twin Cities repair community, have um, our local indigenous partner is Dakota Land Recovery. And um, here comes the, there we go. And in Dakota, the name is Makoche Ikichupi, which means land recovery. Uh, next slide. So Minnesota Makoche is Dakota homeland. Um, the word Minnesota Makoche means land where the waters reflect the sky. So the state name is actually from a Dakota phrase. Next slide. So this land recovery project actually began with Dr. Waziatui's uh, book, What Does Justice Look Like? The Struggle for Liberation in Dakota Homeland. This was 2008 when this was published. And in chapter four, she argued for land reparations. So we traced the 
the history of this project to 2008. Next slide. Then in the next year, 2009, the Dakota Land Recovery Project was launched in the Twin Cities with an evening of reparations fundraiser organized by settler solidarity activists. And so the question that was received from these activists was, um, would it be justice for descendants of the settler, of the settlers to raise money for land buyback, for buyback of Dakota land? And Waz thought about that and she said, yes, that would be justice. It's not justice to expect um, indigenous people to use their own money to buy back stolen land. So white Minnesotans are making reparations in five ways. Returning back rent, returning a portion of land and real estate sales, returning the amount of property taxes, putting reparations in wills and estates, and just recently deeding land over to Makoche Ikichupi, uh, obviously land that Makoche Ikichupi wants. Next slide. Then in 2015, Makoche Ikichupi received nonprofit status and focused on three aspects, return of Dakota land, revitalization of Dakota culture and renewal of the environment. Um, so to the question, what does D Dakota justice look like, at least for these Dakota people, it looks like these three things, land, culture, and environment. Um, you'll see us kind of returning to those two themes. Next slide. And in 2019, Dakota Land Recovery first purchased its first parcel of land in the Minnesota River Valley that has been named Zani Utuwe, which means Village of Wellness. Next slide. So on our timeline, we're going two years later, 2021. Major legislative news. So let's go back to 2019. Makoche Ikichupi began building earth lodges and thought they had permission from the county there to do this. But a Minnesota state building inspector uh, uh, visited the property and issued a stop work order because they were in violation of Minnesota building and fire codes. Um, uh, Dakota Earth Lodges, you know, do not meet the standards for, you know, the kind of square buildings with electricity and plumbing that are required in Minnesota. So for two years, there was a lobbying effort to get, to get the law changed, to provide a waiver process so indigenous people could build according to their own uh, cultural traditions. And that was signed into law by the governor in 2021. So the next slide. And in 2021, there were three earth lodges under construction, water line, an outdoor cook shelter, two compost cookhouses, and the beginning of permaculture plantings or um, regener regenerative farming practices. Um, it really looks something like uh, what Luke was, you know, talking about with his, you know, with, with his little plot that he's developing there. This is what the frame of an earth lodge looks like. Let's continue. And on December 10th, the main earth lodge was covered. So you see a was there. Um, this was just in time for the first real snow of the season. So the first Earth Lodge was completed. Next one. The plan is by the year 2025 to have seven Earth Lodges constructed at Zanio Tuway, this first village, and the permaculture design one well under development. 
The hope is to have six Ochedi Shakawi families living at Zani Otuwe. Ochedi uh, Shakawi means the seven council fires. Uh, these are the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota peoples, or uh, the Ochedi Shakawi uh, uh, council fires. Uh, this is the Makoche Ikechupi logo. Next slide. And finally, by 2050, the hope is to have 10 such village sites throughout Minnesota Makoche. These would be in different parts of the state, would include gardening and foraging lands, hunting lands, fishing and wild ricing lands, and sugar bush lands. And so these, commun these villages would be connected and you know, would be able to trade with each other um, and so forth. So let's go on to the next slide. So we have in Minnesota, can you go back one? We have in Minnesota, the Twin Cities and the Mountain Lake Repair Communities. I'm really gonna focus here on the Twin Cities Repair Community. So next one. By repair, we mean three things. First, repair for dis stolen Dakota land, repair for destruction of Dakota culture, and repair for environmental devastation. This is this triplet that we talked about earlier, land, culture, and environment. Next. And we can identify four methods of making repair. Financial reparations to Makoche Ikichupi, donating time and labor at the build site at Zani Otuwe, shifting our values about nature, and advocating for structural change. An example of that was advocating for a waiver process to allow indigenous people in Minnesota to build according to their culture. So next, and so at the Twin Cities Repair Community, we are engaged in two kinds of activities, volunteer work days and reflection hours. Next. So our first work day was on October 9 of last year in which we were engaged in building the main earth lodge. So on the left, um, that man, Tom, is um, scraping bark. There's probably over 200 logs in each of these earth lodges. And so there's a lot of scraping bark. And those of us who have no skills whatsoever uh, can scrape a lot of bark. And those with skills were engaged in, uh, you know, uh, completing the roof of the earth lodge when, when that was to Completed, it was uh, uh, covered with dirt and then a grass planted on top of it. Next one. So this is what the interior of the main earth lodge looks like. There's a lot of space in there. Next one. Our second work day was on June 11th of this year and we focused on planting trees and bushes. Our first workday, we had 25 volunteers. This workday, we had 36. Because we were not using large equipment like a backhoe, we welcomed children. So you see one of the children there. Um, we planted over 200 uh, trees and bushes on the property there. Next one. And our last workday was on July 16, just a little bit ago and we were building Earth Lodge number two. Next slide. And so our second kind of activity we call reflection hours. And in the Twin Cities Repair Community, we focus on the struggle against the systems of white supremacy, or if you prefer, the struggle against the structures of colonization. So this include, we've identified three kinds of systems or structures. So the, um, the politics of white supremacy and land theft, 
is one thing, the culture of white supremacy and the destruction of indigenous cultures and the economics of white supremacy and environmental devastation. Next. And so land theft is of course directly related to the doctrine of discovery being cemented into US law by the Supreme Court in 1823. I think all of you know about that. Um, uh, just a huge land theft that is based in the doctrine of discovery. Next, destruction of indigenous cultures. We particularly looked at the boarding schools. Um, uh, I think all of you also know about the boarding schools. The attention was the forced assimilation of the indigenous population, um, ethnocide or cultural genocide, if you will. And finally, we looked at, next slide, environmental devastation. Before European invasion and settlement, the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island lived in harmony and balance with nature. The land and waters were pristine. But with European uh, invasion, settlement and development uh, has uh, come environmental devastation. A major root cause of this is the shift away from the view of land as common and sacred to the European American view of land as private property and economic commodity. And so we are working at two levels, the hands-on level where we get a glimpse of what Dakota justice looks like, land return and cultural revitalization and renewal of the environment. But these are only glimpses of uh, Dakota justice, as long as the structures of colonization remain in place. These structures of colonization need to be overturned. And in fact, this is a large part of the work that Sarah Augustine will be leading for our uh, dismantling coalition. So, Doe and I were going to do this together, but I did it solo. Doe is obviously a part of this, but she is feeling a little bit under the weather today. So, uh, so that's why you hear only my voice. Okay, and that's it. Thank you, John. So let's take a few let's take a few minutes for questions or comments for John and the Twin Cities Repair Community. Any comments, questions? Feel free to put them in the chat or come off of uh, mute and share. As I've heard about these workdays several times, I'm reminded of the um, teams that. Mennonite Disaster Services sends out MDS teams, and maybe this is a form of MDS in response to the disaster of colonization, <laughs> of rebuilding, you know, rebuilding what's been destroyed because of settler colonialism at the invitation of indigenous peoples. Yeah, Luke? So a question for John, are there people actually signing up already to live in these places, the villages of healing? Yes, um, um, but not as many as they would like. Um, they recently had at the, uh, you know, at the uh, uh, build site, they recently had a, a day for Ocheti Shakawi people, you know, to come and visit. Um, nearly all Dakota people were forced out of Minnesota or killed. Um, so these are mostly people from uh, South Dakota and some from North Dakota and even other places kind of returning from exile. There were 72 Ocheti Shakawi people there and a lot of people with tears in their eyes. So there's a lot of interest in this. Um, the group is also now looking at uh, obtaining a second property for a second village. And there is already one couple that has said, we want to be 
uh, a part of that second village. Um, so the answer is yes, there is interest. Some have committed, but there need to be some more commitments. Um, it is hard because indigenous people, including Dakota people, have faced forced assimilation for a couple hundred years. Um, it is hard to break away from that assimilation to the dominant culture. Um, and that's part of the struggle. I hope that makes sense, Luke. Thank you, John. Anita, a question or comment? So a question was about, um, was an indigenous architect involved in the design? And then also, um, will people have access to, it sounds like you were saying modern conveniences within the home, like bathrooms within the home or that kind of thing? Is that what you were saying? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. what, what will the dwellings be like? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, plan. yeah, yeah. So, you know, the picture showed you, you know, what an earth lodge looks like. Um, the idea of an earth lodge culturally is for Dakota and Lakota people, a primary symbol is the circle. And so earth lodges are built in a circle. That's purposeful. Um, John Fire Lame Deer, who was a Lakota medicine man, said for indigenous people, the circle connects people with nature and with each other and with the divine. And for the dominant culture, the primary symbol is the square or the rectangle. Like all of our buildings, almost all are squares and rectangles and our screens and so forth. And Lame Deer's critique of that symbol is that the square separates people from nature and from each other and from the divine. And I see some, you know, some sense to that. Um, so there is a cultural reason for the way they are building. Is there an architect? There are thousands of years of engineers and architects who designed these earth lodges. There are very few Dakota people left who know how to build these, but it is a it is historical knowledge that is largely oral knowledge and practical knowledge. And so part of building the earth lodges is the practical experience of more Dakota people uh, learning how to do this. Uh, so it's not that you go to school to become an architect, but you learn how to build an earth lodge by building it on the basis of elders who know how to do this. Um, how about modern conveniences? The vision here is really an ethical vision. It reminds me of Gandhi. Um, uh, live simply so others may simply live and also the ethics of Ocheti Shakowi people, which is expressed in the short phrase, all my relations, to live in right relationship with everything, with every living thing, and virtually everything is living. So it's the interconnectedness of all life. Uh, so that's why people choose to live this way. It's an ethical commitment based on Dakota values. Um, Modern conveniences. There is running water, but there's no interior plumbing. So that the, uh, there are compost toilets. Um, uh, there is you know, just a small solar panel so people can you know, um, charge up their phones and computers. There's no rejection of that. 
Um, but for the most part, these communities are, are based on the idea of local production and local consumption and not relying on fossil fuels uh, and not relying on a technology that assumes the use of fossil fuels. I've given a long answer there, but, uh, but in short, the answer is, if you choose to live in harmony and balance with nature, you may choose to live this way and give up what we consider to be modern conveniences. What is the price of these modern conveniences? Uh, they would ask. Sorry for the long answer. Thank you so much, John, um, and for the questions. And we can continue um, continue you know, in conversation through email and direct your questions to John, but I wanted to make time at the end since Carol's come um, all the way from Arizona, bringing the word of next steps of partnership with um, Apache Stronghold in defense of Oak Flat to give a chance for her to share the last word. And I'll just say thank you all so much for joining, for your commitment to being part of the Repair Network. And I can't wait to continue in. Um, in relationship with you all and to hear what stories you have to share maybe on future Repair Network calls like this. So thank you and I'll turn it over to Carol. Hello, just briefly, I understand you already had a, an intro um, and uh, a deep sharing about Oak Flat. Uh, on Monday, uh, Wensler and Vanessa and Nailene came to Tucson and said that on September 22nd, their um, court case will be dropped in the Supreme Court. That doesn't mean the Supreme Court will take it up <laughs> anytime very soon. But from that day, they have one month to collect um, statements from organizations, churches, denominations, colleges, use your imagination, that will be essentially supporting documents to their case. Um, I wasn't able to be at Mount Graham last night to get more instructions from their uh, attorney on how to do that, but I will get those instructions soon and we'll share them with you. But I ask you to use your imagination about what structures you have um, sway with who might, with help, write a supporting document that will be submitted to the Supreme Court so that the Apache are not alone in saying our religion counts, but especially so that churches and church institutions will also say Apache religion counts. Thank you all. So we'll be in touch by email when we get more information and maybe some examples of what that kind of supporting documents look like um, in support of Oak Flat in that case. So we'll be seeing you all next on October 6th. And in the meantime, um, join our monthly prayer and action calls. Those are open to the public. So invite friends, your community, and reach out to me if you'd like to set up a conversation or presentation with your community about joining the Repair Network or Next Steps. Um, of action for you all. So thank you so much for joining and thank you all for coming out uh, from, from all different parts of, of the continent um, to be with us here today. Um, we're gonna have dinner together. So we're gonna do a little pause time and I'll say good night and goodbye to everyone on Zoom. So good to see you. Blessings to you all this evening. I'm gonna do the big view. Let's see if we can show everybody. Yay. Woohoo. <laughs> Just, maybe you guys can come forward and turn around so they can actually see you in the camera. Come up front. <laughs> we'll wave to you all from, from the room so you don't have to see our backs. Hi, friends and family. <laughs> Got loved ones on the screen. Yay. And baby Belen, the next generation. <laughs> Good night.
Thank you all. Bye, Kimberly. Take care, everyone. Ruth, Eileen, thank you for your patience. This is hybrid meeting. Oh, uh, to these folks here. Yeah, let's do an announcement just saying that dinner is starting in about a minute. You want to help us set up? Or let's say, yeah, okay. Got it. So is everybody.